Good evening to our friends in Kabul. Good afternoon to our friends in Europe and good morning to my friends here in the United States. My name is Jennifer Murtazashvili and I'm a professor of international affairs at the University of Pittsburgh from where I speak to you today. It is an enormous pleasure and honor to welcome you to this very important panel organized by the Afghan Institute for Strategic Studies to discuss a new paper that is just being released today. The paper is called An Assessment of the Possibility of Producing Consensus Within the Parliamentary and Decentralized System of Democracy in Afghanistan. The paper is written by Dr. Mohammed Amin Ahmadi, who is one of Afghanistan's most distinguished scholars in Islamic jurisprudence and constitutional issues. Dr. Ahmadi is a member of the negotiating team of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan that has represented the Republic at peace talks with the Taliban in Doha. He has had a, normal, a, a number of important roles throughout his career and is currently serving as the Chancellor and Professor at Abbasina University in Kabul. Although Dr. Ahmadi is not with us today, I encourage all of you to read this very important paper, which is one of the most thoughtful and creative attempts to integrate the Islamic Republic with the goals of the Taliban. In this sense, the paper released by AISS today represents a concrete proposal towards a constitutional path for peace. To discuss these ideas, we have a distinguished panel of scholars from around the world, all with deep and eminent expertise on issues of governance and history of Afghanistan. So the order of the program, we have Dr. Hussein Yasa, who is the founder of the Afghanistan Group of Newspapers and served more than a decade as the editor in chief of the Daily Outlook in Afghanistan. He is a writer and a political analyst, and he's written many pieces on political and security affairs of Afghanistan and the region. He's an active participant of conference and many seminars on Afghan issues. Dr. Thomas Barfield is professor of anthropology at Boston University and president of the Afghanistan Institute of the American Institute for Afghanistan Studies. And he's the author of numerous books on Afghanistan, but most notably, Afghanistan, A Culture and Political History. Dr. Niamatullah Ibrahimi is a lecturer at uh, international relations at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. He's the author of several books, including The Hazaras and the Afghan State, Rebellion, Exclusion, and the Struggle for Recognition. And finally, we have with us Dr. William Malley, who is Emeritus Professor, now congratulations, Professor, of Diplomacy and International Relations at the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs at Australian National University. Dr. Malley and Dr. Ibrahimi have recently co-authored the new book, Afghanistan, Politics and Economics in a Globalizing State. We have a lot to discuss today. So I'll begin by asking a question of each of our panelists based on the themes outlined in this important paper. They'll speak for a few minutes uh, before we move on to the next round of questions. So Dr. Uh, Yasa, let me begin with you. A central argument of uh, Dr. Ahmadi's paper is that the current constitution uh, with some amendment can build consensus among Republicans as well as with the Taliban. How do you assess this argument? Although I must uh, appreciate, first of all, thank you all of you and uh, Afghanistan Institute of Strategic Studies. And then uh, first of all, I appreciate Dr. Ahmadi with such a good work. And uh, at least uh, what, I, uh, what I get from this paper and reach to the conclusion that the current system of Afghani Afghanistan, which is the presidential and the unitary system is not working and it's not, uh, uh, if I would say it is not responsive to the, to the ground realities of Afghanistan. That I appreciate. As far as, as he said that uh, by some amendment, uh, probably the Taliban and the uh, other side, the Kabul government, uh, they, they, they can reach to some sort of conclusion by some amendment uh, and we don't need any new constitution. There are some space for the amendment. That I, uh, I think it is uh, a little bit over optimism of, uh, of Dr. Ahmadi because as far as when we study the structure, organizational structure of Taliban and their ideological structures and see that they did not speak yet, uh, uh, you see a single paragraph about their uh, uh, probable uh, about their vision or their, uh, you see, 
approach about the uh, uh, probable future polity. They don't say anything. So it means that they are not changed. And uh, I, I think it will be a little bit over optimism about the Taliban, though he has uh, tried his best. And uh, uh, I read it, it's a, it's a good paper. And we will then um, we will discuss uh, further when we will go a little bit ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yasa. Dr. Barfield, the paper argues that the Taliban cannot build political order on their own, that they need to rely on others in society. And this brings us back to the constitution. Do you think that it's possible to integrate the Taliban, the Taliban and their political aspirations with that of the Republic? Do you think that this can, that their goals and desires uh, can be integrated with the current constitution? Do you think that this constitution can be preserved in the future? Well, I think one of the greatest difficulties in Afghanistan is the constitutions have reflected the interest who's who ever write them. Um, and so they're not really designed for talking about consensus. The one thing they all have in common is whether it's a king, a president, or a party chief, they've always been top down and incredibly centralized in terms of the secular government. Um, in, in terms of the communists with the Taliban, it was incredibly centralized with a religious government. I think the only thing that the Taliban and the writers of the current constitution agree upon is they would like to hold the top job. And I do think the paper raises a number of interesting issues later on is the difficulties of Afghanistan have been that its leadership position is so highly centralized, uh, whether it's a king, commissar or emir, that what we get is a desire to hold that top position and then impose the will of that ideology on, on the country. And I believe that's created disaster for Afghanistan under the communist. I think it created a disaster among the Taliban uh, when they were in charge. And I don't think it's done Afghanistan very good to have such a high presidential system because none of these constitutions, and it would be exaggeration to say the, uh, the, the Taliban actually had a constitution when, when they were in charge. But what it's meant is the belief that any political movement can hold power in Kabul can dictate to the rest of the country. And that's produced instability for the past 40 years. My concern is that the current constitution uh, without being rewritten is so highly centralized that, that the fear is whoever gets power uh, will impose themselves without the need of, of, of any consultation. And I believe that's a defect in the current constitution. So while I do think it can be amended, there becomes a certain point in which how many amendments does it take to create a new constitution? So Professor Mali, do you think that this is an issue of constitutional or institutional design? Do you think that, uh, so many of the issues that are laid out and that we're discussing here today really are using institutions to build peace. Do you think that this is possible that um, you know, using this system uh, modifying the system can create and, and building consensus around institutions is a way forward to end the war. Uh, I'm somewhat skeptical about the likelihood that that will flow. I think there are, in a sense, two strands of issues uh, which are highlighted by the paper. On the one hand, there's the issue about the functionality of the existing constitutional framework, and I very much agree with what Tom has said about the uh, challenges that arise from the degree of centralization that exist in the current constitution. And in a sense, that owes a lot also to decisions that were taken at the Bonn conference in um, 2001, which provided for up to 29 departments in the interim administration. So Afghanistan, in a way, was locked into a complex and substantial bureaucratic structure even before the drafting of the constitution itself came into prospect, essentially for political reasons, so the different factions could be locked into support for a new dispensation by giving, getting some positional goods um, in the, the process. And, um, and the result has not been a happy one. I, I was involved in drafting uh, a piece of good advice uh, commissioned by uh, the Centre on International Cooperation at New York University in 
2003 for the use of the Constitutional Drafting Commission, which highlighted some of the problems that could accompany a highly centralised presidential system. And I think the drafters paid not the slightest attention to what I or the other authors of papers in that series had to say, because it was a different kind of exercise. It was one in which um, uh, certain people on the ground had a lot of sway and the uh, influence of the uh, 1964 constitution was probably excessive in shaping the character of the 2004 constitution. That's one sort of issue, the functionality of the existing constitution. There's then a, a slightly separate uh, issue of whether a new constitutional framework could be put in place that would be sufficiently uh, satisfactory from the Taliban's point of view that they would buy into a process that uh, resulted in such a constitution, but also preserve enough of the existing framework, what's positive in the existing framework to bridge the gap between the two parties. And that's where I'm actually quite skeptical because I think a lot of the Taliban's vision has historically been totalitarian with a kind of Führer Prinzip underlying their approach to politics and administration, a non-constitutional approach to the exercise of power, as opposed to a much more pluralist model that the Republican uh, system uh, uh, desirably would put in place, even if the existing constitutional framework has been very patchy in its achievements in that respect. And it doesn't seem to me that uh, there's yet much indication that that gap between the Taliban and the proponents of a Republican model um, is likely to be uh, bridged either through negotiation or any other process that's on the horizon just at the moment. One of the, the, the Taliban's you know, objections to the current constitution, you know, especially the 2004, Const the 2004 constitution, is that they see the constitution as an imposition by outsiders um, and that it is inherently not legitimate. And so the paper suggests that reforming the current political order would require going back to the 1964 constitution, which they argue was actually more, uh, which Dr. Ahmadi argues is more democratic in many ways. And we'll talk about that point in a minute. But getting back to this point of religion, uh, Dr. Ibrahimi, I think that uh, you know one of the questions that's raised is this relationship between religion and politics, religion and the state. And one of the proposals made in, the, in, in by Dr. Ahmadi is that the, Afghanistan moved to a parliamentary system because a parliamentary system would allow for the indirect selection of political leaders, which he believes the Taliban would be more amenable to, that this is sort of more in line with their thinking about the way that leaders are should be selected. And um, that, that, that this could be sort of a way to accommodate this difference. And I'm wondering what, if, if you have any thoughts about this sort of the accommodation of religious leaders, what role would the ulama play in this? Uh, can the parliament function as a kind of ulama in, in this system? And what are your thoughts about uh, these divergent roles about the role of religion in the state? Uh, thank you, Professor Mutazashvili and everyone else. Let me also join you in commending uh, Dr. Amin Ahmadi for producing this really creative and imaginative paper uh, on an issue uh, that is, you know, I think we all understand quite complex. Uh, and I think he has put forward a proposal that deserves a, a lot more discussion and elaboration. Um, and I'm quite happy to be part of this process here. I, I, I think, you know, that whole debate about the role of religion, Islam in Afghanistan, is uh, you know, quite a central part of this paper by Dr. Amin Ahmadi. And he is essentially trying to resolve two main uh, challenges that I think confronts Afghanistan as it tries to find a way to make peace with the Taliban. First, I think this issue of democracy versus uh, theocracy. And the Taliban has attempted to produce and, and impose a model of uh, Islamic Emirate in 1996 to 2001, which was you know, one of the most conservative, authoritarian, diplomatic orders Afghanistan perhaps the world has seen. And then uh, the other debate is about you know, centralization versus decentralization. And I think in, in that respect, I think uh, many of, as many of us uh, would agree, there is a lot of agreement emerging 
uh, the scholarly literature, um, that you know, the current uh, presidentialized system, and the way it concentrates power in the office of one, uh, uh, in one office in Kabul is producing many challenges that are, I think, contributing to the failure of governance uh, and security that we have witnessed over the past 20 years in Afghanistan. So now, you know, on that question of whether in a, in a new constitution, uh, parliamentary democracy can resolve uh, you know, the challenges of uh, you know, religious, uh, re the rule of religion in uh, public life, I think yeah, uh, it is there's so much more that I think has to be elaborated. Uh, you know, the Taliban as a movement has been incredibly uh, you know, secretive in their thinking. They have revealed so much. Uh, over the past few years, I think a couple of years in particular, we have seen uh, what you may describe as this, uh, this discursive shift uh, with regards to the Taliban, uh, which is trying to point to ways that Taliban have probably, hopefully, changed uh, yeah, in the way they would like to see Afghanistan being around in the future. But, uh, but as we know, you know, they haven't produced much. They were the first attempt in 1998 to create a constitution. And there was something uh, recently revealed to the media, uh, leaked, uh, and the Taliban denied you know, having, uh, you know, owning that document as your uh, charter for future government in Afghanistan. So I think there's very little that we know, you know, why there is interest, a hope for a transformed Taliban movement that will, you know, accommodate, um, the desire and, and, and governance needs of Afghanistan in the 21st century. And I'm, I think, like everybody else, quite a skeptical um, you know, to see uh, that the Taliban has changed, in fact. Uh, you know, while the Taliban has you know, written very little, and in, fa in fact, is speak very little about what they would like to see, what their vision is for the future of Afghanistan, but we know how the Taliban behaves. You know, from the history, but also in areas that they have uh, controlled now, uh, and, and we can see the impact of their, um, you know, repressive policies coming back and having an impact on Afghan women's education in many parts of uh, the country. So now that the that the U.S. has announced its military withdrawal, um, I think it's hard to get through any conversation about Afghanistan without discussing this important point. Mm -hmm. Where do all of you see the, these negotiations going? Not just the negotiations about you, the, peace, the peace agreement, obviously, is, is very important, or finding a path to peace. But this constitutional arrangement really requires a political leaders to give up power, right? The proposal that we see by Dr. Ahmadi requires a, a weakened executive branch. And in, as Professor Barfield uh, you know, laid out, we have a very strong executive in, in Afghanistan, and, th and that has been sort of consistent throughout history. So the, the, the political game is this sort of zero-sum contestation about who gains control of the state, and it becomes a very zero-sum game for everybody involved. Do you think that these peace negotiations, given that the U.S. is going to withdraw, changes those incentives to all, to, to radically alter this constitutional system where you might have a power sharing agreement along the lines that this paper suggests. Dr. Yas, I'll begin, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to respond and then if the others want to uh, chime in, please do. Yeah, unfortunately, as far as uh, uh, United States uh, withdrawal is, uh, troops withdrawal is concerned, I, I, I won't comment on that because Mr. Khalilzad has already summed up that United States doesn't want the permission of anybody to, to go to anywhere or to withdraw from somewhere. So uh, their own priorities, why they came to Afghanistan and why they are living, they have their own, in, its own internal dimension or external dimension, whatever. But uh, as far as uh, uh, Dr. Ahmadi's proposal is concerned, I once again appre appreciate him. There are a couple of important things, but something are missing. No doubt that Afghanistan need, needs a, a new social contract. And uh, there, there should be uh, some, uh, some radical change in, in, in that approach, which was there in 2001. And it was very, very badly manipulated with the, with the people as uh, Professor Barfield, I think also he has mentioned in his book, 
that uh, 2001, uh, so much resources, a new technology, uh, international support, but the idea of a statehood was from the 19th century. So, and uh, uh, probably that's why one of the prime reason that Taliban has become a very big challenge at the moment. But just, just keep in view that a couple of uh, years back when Taliban was not a big challenge. So uh, again, there were a lot of challenges between the uh, various communities and nobody was very much comfortable with, with this sort of uh, uh, constitutional arrangement, which, is, which, which was based on national state and very strong presidential and uh, uh, unitary state. Now, let me come to that, Dr. Ahmadi, once again. Dr. Ahmadi, okay. I'm also one of the strong advocates of uh, uh, consensus democracy, which Dr. Ahmadi says, parliamentary form of uh, uh, democracy as well as proportional representation, that is good. What, what I miss there, that Dr. Ahmadi did not address the properly, I think, or effectively, the vertical distribution of power, which is very, very important. And over the period of the time, the natural, uh, you see, zones of Afghanistan, which was developed over the centuries was very brutally, all of those were divided into small, small, uh, small, small provinces without any uh, basic and positive approach. Like you have in, in a lot of countries, uh, they have their own policies, like they increase the number of their administrative divisions uh, or sometimes they decrease, but there are uh, some uh, some static vision behind why uh, why we are increasing our our administrative divisions or why we are decreasing. So now the way it was it was done uh, from Amanullah Khan uh, uh, onward, Amanullah Khan, and then uh, uh, especially during the it started very brutally during the Daud Khan time, and when he resigned, the new government came in 1963 for the first time, uh, which is uh, which is not very much discussed. We, we discussed too much the 1965's uh, uh, administrative, uh, uh, you see, uh, uh, law, uh, which shows Afghanistan with 28 provinces. In 1963, I found another, uh, another decree that it was, it was showing that Afghanistan already it was in, distributed in 29 provinces. So now what was the approach? As uh, some, some many, many good people, they have already noticed this, that there was a very, very bad intention uh, behind these divisions and until, unless. Now you see, when you see any map of Afghanistan, uh, 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 demographic map, ethno-demographic map of Afghanistan, you may find, like in a big uh, uh, central Afghanistan, there is a, by green color or by yellow color, this is the land of Hazaras, this is the land of Uzbeks in some areas, this is the land of Tajiks, this is the land of Pashtuns. Where are those? It doesn't, in, in our administrative system, it doesn't reflect. It was inhuman and unjust, which was very uh, brutally designed to, to, to guarantee this uh, domination, tribal domination in Afghanistan. I would suggest that this is the time, as far as Taliban are concerned, they share the same view as Mr. Ghani. One is playing with the Sharia, the other is playing with the uh, uh, republicanism. But you see, both of them are following the same strong nation state uh, uh, theory. Ghani, uh, in one way, and the Taliban, they don't mention the nation. They mention Ummah, Umma, which is Islamic word. 62 times it is mentioned in Quran Majid. So, uh, but they follow the same strong centralized government, which is not compatible with the, with the ground realities of Afghanistan, I would suggest that the geographical identities of the people, the native people of Afghanistan should be returned to them. It was, it was uh, built over the centuries and it was just left, just uh, uh, lapsed a couple of uh, decades back until unless there won't be a proper system which would clearly uh, 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 tell you the vertical and the horizontal distribution of power. I don't think uh, that any system would work in Afghanistan, and uh, for example, if I'm uh, if I'm not taking your time, for example, how would you accommodate Taliban in this in this system in this unitary system? How would you come accommodate that? So huge difference. I'm in touch with the people who are there in, in Doha. Sometimes they don't talk to them. 
See, sometimes when they say about the social justice, so then say this, this is the term, terminal, uh, term of the infidels. We should talk about the Islamic justice. When you talk about democracy, forget about this. Americans are going, these all terminologies will go with them. When you, when you talk about the uh, uh, religious, uh, you see, uh, rights of the various people, they say, no, it is very difficult. We are only one Muslim brothers. So if you don't have a common language, if you don't have a, a shared type of definitions of many things, how, how will you accommodate Taliban? This is only possible in the federal system. Theoretically, now what will happen to Afghanistan? I, I don't know. I don't see a very smooth, uh, smooth future, but there is a, the parliamentary form of democracy, consensus democracy is not enough. Federal parliamentary form of system is the only uh, way to solve the problem once for all. Thank you very much. Professor Barfield, I know you, you've got a lot to say on this and you've written quite a bit on this. I'm just curious to hear your response. Um, one of the things is to recognize the difference between de facto structures of power and de jure ones and the constitutional ones are set up, that's the law. And I, and I do agree that it was a deliberate policy to increase the number of provinces to actually make local administration more problematic. Um, Afghanistan has historically been four, five, six major regions going all the way back to the Persian empire. Um, each of them has a central city, whether it be Kandahar, Herat, Mazar, Kabul, that have been there for a really long time. I think one of the things that's likely to happen in terms of devolution of power is that neither the Taliban right now nor Ashraf Ghani are interested in devolving any power. The question is what happens? Right now, the Taliban believe if the Americans are, believe, are, are leaving, then they'll take over. Why make any compromises? Um, the question that comes, and I am reminded when the Soviets withdrew, there was also a similar enthusiasm on the part of the Mujahideen that they would be in Kabul within six months, and they were not. And the Najib regime did not uh, collapse until after the Soviet Union did. So one of the questions happens is what happens when both sides find that they cannot seize absolute power? And in particular, I think whether it becomes an actual civil war or just a reorganization of for local protection, uh, the regions of Afghanistan will be looking to protect themselves, at which point within the Taliban, will there be a difference of people who will fight to the last man to create a centralized emirate? And which of the local Taliban would be more interested in negotiating uh, some kind of power sharing agreement? And the reason that you would then not have necessarily a high executive is that neither side would want it. Um, if there is no singular power in charge of Kabul to take, then it's dangerous for either side to trust the other one holding that position. But that's only likely to happen in a stalemate. If the Taliban feel that they, they cannot, that there'll be another 10 years in the wilderness, and people in Kabul think we need to end this war, at that point, um, President Ghani is, has said, admittedly under different conditions, that he would be willing to step down. There may be some people that will take him at his word, um, at which point the agreement will not be, um, if it's to, to be lasting, who's going to be the supreme leader to replace Ashraf Ghani on a different basis, but rather that neither side would trust the other with that much executive power. If that's the case, then what we would see is, is sort of a de facto regionalism which is certainly, if we look at the United States, uh, the states have tremendous amount of sovereign power locally, but they rely on the national government for many important things. Same thing could happen with Afghanistan. There are a lot of things that you can't do by, by region, um, but communities want to see themselves protected, particularly in a time of potential anarchy. They trust each other more than they trust anybody else. So I, I could see a movement, whether, whether that's called a federal system, whether it's part of, a, a, you know, part of a constitutional system, is less important than the actual power relationship. But the only way I see uh, a willingness of either side to give up the idea of absolute power is if it doesn't appear, appear achievable or attainable. And right now, the Taliban think they can take it. 
But if they can't, there may be factions within to say, you know, if, if, if we can't win outright, what kind of deal can we strike? That would be the time for real negotiations. To, to follow up, um, Professor Malley, on this point, it would seem that if the government were interested in, you know, one way to hedge a possible Taliban takeover is to move at some point now to weaken the executive seems kind of counterintuitive, right? But if you weaken the power of the executive, at least formally, you create the opportunity you create maybe stronger incentives for regional players uh, to, to participate, uh, to be stronger allies of the center if they don't see this sort of uh, winner take all system uh, that Professor Barfield has described at the center. Uh, why hasn't the, the central government moved to change any of this right now, understanding the, the threat of uh, Taliban takeover of a very centralized system? I think it's in part because there's a very long standing and durable conviction within at least elements of the Afghan political elite that uh, a strong state is the solution to Afghanistan's problems. And I remember hearing this more than 25 years ago, emphatically from Said Qasem Rishdia, uh, who was one of the architects of the 1964 um, constitution. I think it actually derives from a kind of Hobbesian view that in a fractious environment it's necessary to have a common power to hold all others in awe. Uh, the difficulty with that, of course, is that if you have a process of state unraveling as Afghanistan experienced in the 1990s and you then announce that your intention is to put a strong state a centralized state into place. You create incentives for all sorts of people to struggle ferociously for control of that state because they fear that if anyone else gets control of the state, they'll be able to use it to, to their own detriment. And so it tends to fuel a much more ferocious politics than otherwise one might have. And in a sense, I think some of the rather odd episodes that have uh, occurred this year, the confrontation with Commander Ali Poor and then the ongoing uh, uh, controversy over uh, Governor Lahmani reflect in part a desire of the central authorities to find whatever mechanism they can at their disposal to assert that they are still a powerful force, uh, even if it involves picking fights that might not seem to make all that much sense at a time when the Taliban is, is the main player about which they need to be uh, concerned. But I think one of the reasons that also facilitates that kind of positioning is that the peace process itself is really not a peace process. It began as an American exit process, although it was dressed up as a, as a peace process. It's substantially been degraded by strategic stalling on the part of the Taliban, who have no particular incentive to make any concessions at the moment. And I suspect if we reach the point that, that uh, Tom Barfield was anticipating where there might be a hurting stalemate at some point in the future, if there are then negotiations, it will be in a very different kind of context from that which Doha or Istanbul would offer. In, in a way, I think it's a, it's a bit of a waste of time to invest too much in uh, the mythology of that particular process when there are genuine incentives driving the parties in different directions at the moment. And what we really should be thinking about is how Western positioning might incentivize particular behaviors on the part of the different players and what unintended consequences might flow from uh, measures that uh, external powers uh, take. And one of the things that's actually disturbed me the most in the last year and a half really has been the extent to which Halil Zad and various presidents have been almost uh, blithely indifferent to the psychological impact on the ground in Afghanistan of various uh, statements and positions that they've adopted. People are watching all the time to see from which direction the wind is blowing, and that then disposes people to orient themselves in particular ways, because it's not rational to be on the losing side in a place like Afghanistan. And here I go back to Hobbes, uh, who in Leviathan said, reputation of power is power. And I think quite a lot of what's going on at the moment is to do with uh, an inchoate understanding on the part of at least some Afghan um, actors that they need to be able to project a reputation of power if they're able to save the situation. 
you know, Professor uh, Ibrahimi, you know, along those lines, um, over the, if you're looking at these different groups and the projection of power that we've seen from the different groups, both within the, you know, from the Taliban within, but also within the, the Afghan government side, there's many factions and uh, who are represented in, in these negotiations and they are by no means unified in their approach to these negotiations. Uh, and one of the issues that has really come up in recent years is the eth eth ethnic ethnicization of politics. And uh, you know, especially over the past 10 years, this has become particularly acute. I remember reading you know, Professor Miley and Professor Barfield's work from 20 years ago, where they're describing a very different kind of Afghan society where ethnicity wasn't as salient as it is now in politics. Do you think that these kinds of constitutional reforms, you know, suggested here, a parliamentary system, for example, um, could help de-ethnicize politics? Do, you know, what, what do you, uh, of course, there's so much uncertainty. So the dynamics of Professor Malley, Professor Barfield, Dr. Yama have suggested, uh, there's so much uncertainty about what's gonna take place in the battlefield. We could argue that one of the reasons why these negotiations are, are important is not for the outcome that they produce, but for the opportunity for these players to get to know each other. Um, but could this negotiations lead to a kind of de eth I can't say this word, de-ethnicization of politics in Afghanistan? Well, I think you know that is an often. Um, I mean, there's probably emerging evidence now that over the past twenty years, ethnicity has become you know, a lot more salient in Afghan politics, uh, and this has to do um, with you know, many um, ways in which the Afghan politics was structured. I think, and the centralization of power. Uh, and the way it concentrates all power in uh, one office has also contributed. And I think there's also uh, some form of bottom-up responses to that sort of you know, national level politics. Uh, and many of those people who respond to politics at the national level are beginning to redraw you know, their identities and often ethnicity has become one of the more salient ones uh, in, in during this period. So now looking forward, I think ethnicity is a major factor, but often people are not very explicit in talking about it. Um, let us take the example of centralization versus decentralization. I think there are often myths in Afghan publics, among Afghan political elites, in Afghan political imagination that associate certain forms of political system with ethnic identity, uh, politics, and interests. So one of those is, for example, that Pashtuns uh, have an interest in um, you know, a strong centralized state. You know, minorities would benefit from a decentralized uh, parliamentary or federal system. So while I think there can be a you know, strong argument that can be made uh, pro or against either of these, uh, but I think you know, in uh, Afghanistan, I think in recent years, we have seen a research in public culture where we talk about many issues. And unfortunately, this centralization, this decentralization is not one of those issues that we can talk very freely about. Uh, because uh, the way, you know, Afghan political imagination sees this is if you talk about decentralization or federalism, yeah, you might be easily, you know, condemned uh, and, and, and called you know, for treason and everything else, right? So I think looking forward, I think in a lot of ways, you know, uh, the Taliban uh, uh, in certain political groups in Kabul, they have a shared interest in centralization. Uh, and the Taliban is a heavily centralized group and they would like to reimpose that. They have a sort of Islamist imagination that would like to impose on the Afghan society from uh, Kabul. And, and for them, you know, pretty much like others, the communists in Kabul, in a strong government is uh, a vehicle for that social transformation. But I also see, I think, you know, a lot depends on the de, de facto power relations that are likely going to develop in Afghanistan over the next months and years. Uh, uh, you know, while these issues are being raised, and I think they see in a greater uh, convergence of agreements on the challenges that are resulting from such a heavily centralized system. But I think in Kabul, at least in Afghan languages, many Afghans are not very comfortable talking about this. 
And those who do, and often remain on the fringes of the Afghan politics in public sphere, if you would like to call it that way. And so I think uh, the, the Taliban, you know, when they come to power, they, you know, they bring in a certain ethnic uh, dimensions to their uh, in a role in Afghan politics, you know, being a predominantly in a passion movement coming from the South, you know, you know, despite the rhetoric of pan-Islamism or whatever, you know, by, by virtue of their presence in Kabul, they make the space a lot more narrower for other uh, groups like the Tajiks and the Hazaras in, in Uzbeks. And I think there's a lot of these issues uh, that are already in people's mind, but I think it would be good to explore while, uh, you know, in, in the midst of this uncertainty about the situation in the military fronts. Jennifer, could I jump in on that point? Yes, please, please. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very important point, and it, it, it brings to my mind uh, an, another issue that was taken up by Dr. Ahmadi in his paper, which was the choice of electoral system. And here, I think uh, there are two points that stand out. One is that when we're talking about constitutional change, it's actually very important to be alert to the ways in which different components of a constitutional and political system can have subtle interactions with each other, uh, which uh, need to be contemplated with the greatest of care before one goes down particular pathways, uh, because the ramifications can be quite dramatic. And we actually see that in the uh, choice of the single non transferable vote system for elections within the Walesi Jirga. Um, specialists on electoral systems I think we're very wary when it surfaced because it is a system that rewards groups that can have very disciplined blocks of followers uh, who can be tasked with splitting the votes between different candidates on a ballot paper in order to maximize the number of seats that come back. And we saw that hugely ethnicized when uh, the uh, seats went to Hazaras rather than uh, Pashtuns in Ghazni at the time of the 2010 election that then led to the special court process and the political crisis which flowed from that. That was not because anyone I think set out to put in place an electoral system that would have this particular consequence but it was a consequence that might have been identified had there been more time and more attention devoted to anticipating what the consequences of that particular choice might be. And in a sense, the, this takes me back to uh, a literature on institutional design uh, from the 1990s. There was a very fine study of the theory of institutional design uh, in a book edited by Robert Gooden, who argued that when one's looking at institutions, it's important to think of revisability, robustness, sensitivity to motivational uh, complexity and variability when one's designing institutions, that it's in a sense not an activity for uh, the faint-hearted because one needs to show the utmost care in propagating uh, particular institutions as a preferred uh, choice and one needs then to think how a recommendation in one area will intersect with uh, recommendations that might arise in uh, other areas. And there's been some very good work done, for example, by Professor Donald Horowitz, looking at the ways in which different electoral systems might either discourage or encourage ethnic entrepreneurship within a society. And they're not things that are necessarily terribly obvious at first glance, but which become uh, clearer once one begins to probe into the possible ways in which electoral systems might uh, play out on the ground. Yes, I, th I think one of the, the things that needs to be brought up, which actually was not in the paper, was the absence of political parties in Afghanistan. And that was a defect going back to the 64 constitution. It's been repeated under the current constitution. And so when we look at the question of, of greater ethnization in Afghanistan, one of the reasons that encouraged that is there have been no political parties that might negotiate across ethnic blocks for practical reasons. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to divide up the parliament if you don't allow political parties? Is it any surprise that you got a Pashtun and non-Pashtun block? Mm -hmm. um, Similarly, if, if you were talking about negotiations, um, 
it would be, as we find in many democracies, easier to build a cross-ethnic coalition if you're able to push certain themes that intersect between those, those groups, that they agree to a lie, even though they don't, they're not the same, they may have conflicting interests in other ways, but they create very powerful coalitions. And I believe this was certainly something the King was aware of, and it certainly seems to be something that both the presidents of Afghanistan under 2004 constitution were aware of, is that prevents the challenge to executive authority. It's one thing to talk about creating a parliamentary system, but without a mention of how do you have a parliamentary system without political parties? I think the Americans were somewhat unclear on this because the American constitution makes no mention of political parties. And the founders of the United States were also like constitutional writers in Afghanistan, believe that political parties were divisive, you shouldn't have them. However, the United States democracy immediately had very powerful and divisive political parties, and we've had two of them ever since. They change over time, but then the parties are extremely powerful. The British parliament depends upon political parties. How we can talk about an Afghan constitutional order that refuses to allow candidates to run under a party label. It's no wonder if you have 100 people running for parliament, uh, it's only gonna take uh, you and your relatives uh, and a few more people to be elected. But if you had 100 people running and a number of them said, we will throw our support behind a candidate of a particular type who is recognized on the ballot as, you, you get a very powerful uh, a change in dynamics. So one of the things in terms of talking about constitutional change, it seems to me, is something, even though it's not considered constitutional, why has there never been an electoral law recognizing parties, allowing groups to organize as official political parties to run candidates? And there can never be a successful democracy in Afghanistan without allowing formal political parties. And neither the Taliban nor the Ashraf Ghani government has any interest in doing that. So it seems to me you're sort of, you're tinkering around the edges until, and it doesn't, and that doesn't, the thing is that doesn't have to be a fundamental constitutional change. It's a law. It was, it only had to be a law under the 64 constitution, only has to be a law now. It was a law that was never passed. So it seems to me that, that one of the defects right now is, and particularly if, if we're, we're worried about the potential for civil war, the groups that we fall back on are those that happened in the 1990s, which are ethnic. It was interesting that in the Soviet period, the conflict was not ethnic, it was ideological. As soon as essentially the ideological regime collapsed, we find PDPA troops dividing between Tajik factions and Pashtun factions. In times of anarchy, Afghanistan tends to revert back to the local, back to the ethnic. And we move away from an ideological conflict, which is what we've kind of got now, like uh, the, the Taliban saying, you know, we're gonna create this Islamic state and the Republic side saying, no, we've, we've got essentially a secular state with, with Islamic concerns. If it breaks down, I don't think any people are gonna be kind of interested and these broader ideological questions, what they're gonna be interested in is more questions of power, which was the great unraveling in, in the 1990s, which pushed back uh, repowered ethnic groups that had not been, dur during the jihad against the Soviet ethnic groups were not the key drivers. During the civil war they were. So we, we see alt alternative moves back and forth uh, in Afghanistan from how people organize themselves. And one of the reasons for this is the absence of, of smaller scale political parties that would be that would be that would be designed to make deals and to govern, not to represent either particular leaders or particular extreme ideologies. Uh, May, uh, I think that uh, this uh, inherent type of differences is not only confined to Afghanistan, but most of the countries of the world, they have different type of people, different cultures, ethnic groups, different languages. Uh, 
uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Ibrahimi uh, mentioned, I would say that uh, Newton's third law of motion, uh, it is not a bad thing if a country is consists of different type of people. The problem starts from the point when you start denying that fact. Uh, the history of Afghanistan was very, very bad in this regard. And uh, uh, I would, I would uh, uh, come in uh, with apologies uh, uh, to Mr. Barfield. Uh, yes, uh, during the Soviet invasion, there was uh, the ideological aspect of the, the whole uh, situation was too much dominant, but the, deeply the ethnic issue was also embedded in that. And uh, you see why the ethnic uh, question was not raised at that time, because every community was preparing, though it was unconscious, but every community was, every ethnic group was preparing uh, to manifest itself. So when, uh, when the Uzbeks found uh, that they are now enough strong to raise their voice, they started their uh, voices. And then uh, uh, the Hazaras, same. And you don't find any strong Hazara voice when there was uh, eight different small, small parties. Their voice has become very strong when all these parties, they made a coalition, a, a single party, which was his brother. Same as, as, uh, 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 as far as the Uzbeks are concerned. So now I, I, would, I would suggest uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, the scholars there in Afghanistan, they should, it was a very good start. They should, they should also explore the other uh, uh, unsaid uh, you see aspects of uh, Afghan society, which, which has been taboo. And now I, I remember when I was Afghanistan and I, I saw a lot of problem because of this, uh, because I was one of the founders of, of the Afghanistan National Front and uh, the issue, formally the issue of decentralization is started uh, through a formal paper. It was 2010 when Afghanistan National Front was met. But it, the reaction was too high, too high. Many people, they, they suffered because of, of, of that issue. I'm one of those. And you see, when you, when you pronounce the F of the federalism, the people will behave you the same as uh, uh, the end of 18th century of the France, when the federal issue was there, somebody was talking, so they were they were uh, uh, they were charged with the treason. So now it, this has become the the situation. As far as uh, many people who who, who raise the issue of uh, very correctly, uh, uh, because uh, a PR system of election is is incomplete without the political parties, and then the why it was not. The, you, uh, let me tell you that Afghanistan's political party law here at the moment. It is one of the toughest in the region. One of the toughest in the region. But, but even though many political parties are registered there, but useless because they don't have any electoral load, uh, role. Our, uh, our uh, uh, esteemed uh, uh, rulers who came from the West, they don't have any root among the people. They don't have any political party. Among the Pashtun elites, the political parties are only three important parties, Taliban, Hikmatyar, and uh, the liberal part of uh, our Pashtun brothers, they, they were too much concentrated in Afghan Millat Party, Afghanistan Social Democratic Party. So what they did, they did not scatter the other parties, but they also is, uh, made the various faction of even Afghan Millat too, because they didn't have any political party and they did not allow any political party to be flourished. So now and they are very much comfortable with this tribal type of uh, lord who is ruling Afghanistan. How is it possible you studied in the in the most advanced countries of the world and you are uh, you are talking about the uh, very uh, about the democracy, various uh, aspect of the democracy, but you both the presidents they don't have any political party. They did not even a single day try to to make a political party because they don't believe in Afghanistan. Now see. Uh, in in uh, as uh, everybody knows that we are we are not going to face a, a, a face a uh, you see a smooth future because as far as I see just just think that you are Taliban and from the position of the Taliban just think that what would be your reaction at that time you resist against the Americans 150,000 forces were there. You did not surrender now the Americans are leaving the Americans uh, whose uh, top agenda was to prevent the Taliban from coming back. 
uh, to power. And now they are negotiating with a, as, as a political important uh, stakeholder with the Taliban. So now uh, they are too much encouraged and they believe that they can, they can take by, by force, which is very wrong. I would say this is not 90s. Uh, a takeover of Taliban is not a very easy question because this is my job and I, I have a very uh, deep contacts with a lot of people in the North very high level of preparation is going on to resist against the Taliban. One. Second, this equation of, uh, of the various uh, equation of power, the balance of between the various communities of Afghanistan is not acceptable for the region. It will be very badly involve the region once again. And I, I also believe that this time, this probable civil war will not last very long, probably four years, five years. But at that time, if we will not address these important and key issues now, the distribution of power, the most and the most uh, genuine way, at that time, I'm afraid that uh, uh, the people might think that either we can live with the Taliban with so much differences in a single geography or not. So that's why to, to preserve the uh, integrity of Afghanistan, this is very important that all of uh, us inside Afghanistan, outside Afghanistan would concentrate the most practical and the genuine way. Not, uh, not uh, by force, it is, it is not possible. Why there should be ethnic number one, ethnic number two, ethnic number three? The Pashtun should be always the head of a state because they are the owner. Just tell me why Afghanistan doesn't have any census? Why Afghanistan doesn't have any organizer, organized, uh, you see, electoral system? These are all the fact system. And I know I was the I was involved in 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 in, in two thousand four uh, uh, constitutional uh, Louis I was I was there. This this was this was a fake process. This constitution was imposed. It is fabricated. Even this is not the constitution which was designed, which was drafted by the constitutional uh, committee. So uh, I would say that this is inhuman. Pashtun should be ethnic number one, Tajik should be number two, Azara, uh, two number, Azara's number three, Uzbek's number four. Why? Why shouldn't uh, Nuristani should be the president of Afghanistan? Why? And why, why there, there is a, 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 a why we are, we are developing this uh, unhealthy trend to Afghanistan? This is creating rift among the uh, people of Afghanistan. And it will, it will, we are actually cultivating the, uh, you see, the, the seeds of enmity. And this reaction, this time the reaction will be very, very strong. Let me tell you, God bless Afghanistan and his, his people. Uh, I, I think this approach from the Taliban side and from the side sitting in Kabul, uh, uh, I would pray that our uh, elites of our Pashtun brothers, political elites, they would, they would change their 1900s uh, uh, century theory of uh, statehood. This is the only way. The coexistence is everywhere. Everywhere they have addressed their, uh, their, uh, their issues, their differences. Why we cannot solve? We can also self, uh, change it, uh, uh, solve it, but we need to change our basic idea of statehood and we should adopt the idea of coexistence. Thank you. You know, so, so along these lines, this is a very, uh, important opportunity right now. And, you know, I think Dr. Yasa has articulated the desire for many to see changes in the way power is organized. And the way that this paper discusses this is through institutional changes, right? And so I think the question for all of you really is thinking, you know, can institutions change society? or must society be driving this? And let me just give you an example. Uh, Professor Barfield has raised the issue of political parties. And many people say, well, you know, you have these political parties in Afghanistan. Well, of course you can't have political parties, you know, playing a stronger role. This was the argument 20 years ago, right? That, that, that these are all ethnic factions and uh, they're strongmen factions. And if you bring them into the political system, you'll just have more, more war. So the consequence of this is that 20 years later, you still have the same factions. They're still organized the same way and they're not participating in politics in a formal way because the political party law has kept them out. The SNTV system that Professor Malley has, has discussed intentionally weakens the role of political parties for the fear that we saw 20 years ago. 
So in order to move beyond this ethnic nature of parties, this factional nature of parties, you need a, a political party law that actually brings these parties, that brings, that creates opportunities for new parties to emerge within the political system. And that has not occurred. Um, so, you know, thinking very broadly about this role of institutions, and it's a really confusing moment right now, I think, because we're talking about all these wonderful ideas of constitutional design. Uh, Dr. Ahmadi's paper, you know, and it's a question I want to raise in a few minutes about religious differences, um, Hanafi jurisprudence, Jafari ju jurisprudence, how these can coexist within the constitutional framework. But you know, it, to what extent can these institutions be the foundation of a future when we're in the middle of this very difficult conflict? Is, is now the time to come to a consensus on this? And why haven't these factions outside uh, who are not the Taliban come to a greater understanding of what a future state could look like. Why isn't there more discussion of this kind of institutional issues? Uh, Professor Malley has also suggested that this is because of this need to consolidate the states, need to preserve the executive, but now seems to be the time to, to be having these discussions. Uh, Dr. Ibrahimi. Bill would like to go first. No, please go ahead, Neil. Well, I, I mean, this is, I think, really a critical question. I think while, you know, uh, Afghanistan is in the middle of uncertainty because of the conflict and military fronts, uh, I think the institutional question will be, I think, a key to the future of the country. Uh, let me tell you a quick an example I saw recently, you know, you know, last weekend when we saw that, you know, horrific school bombing in Dashi Barshi targeting the Hazara women and girls, there's some people in Jalalabad, they went out holding a sign saying, I am a Hazara Pashtun. Okay. So for many people, this was an orderly you know, expression of uh, you know, solidarity by the Pashtun brothers, you know, you know, to an attack that has targeted you know, Hazara uh, girls and, uh, and young um, children so badly. But many people missed the point. That rally, that group of people was organized by Habasagi Mili Afghanistan, which is in a left-leaning political party in Afghanistan. And those parties you know, were the only one that had the appeal, the organizational capacity, the network to appeal you know, across you know, ethnic boundaries in Afghanistan. And this is something you know, which was close to my heart you know, for many years when I was in Kabul. I was looking at, it is not that, you know, attempts were not made. I think, you know, for those of us who are familiar in Kabul, there were attempts to make, make, uh, build, you know, multinational, multi-ethnic coalitions around programmatic ideas. And there were also attempts to discuss new programs of development in the transformation of the country. And there were also attempts to reform this old, you know, ethno-factional networks. You know, attempts to reform him, Mahler, Jimbish, Jamiat, all of this were you know, by younger people in, in, in the early 2000s. You know, I saw that, right? So what happened was that you know, when they, institution, they designed an institution which discriminated against the political parties, right? Uh, and literally turned political parties into irrelevant actors, right? And then in addition to this, what they did was like, they used patronage, okay? From the presidential palace, to buy the loyalty of a strongman. Okay? The argument was that we don't have uh, one half political parties because they are, uh, you know, these ethnic entrepreneurs and warlords and whatnot, right? But in practice, what they did was that they killed the institutional environment for the development and revitalization of political parties, which existed. And I think it exists now in Afghanistan. You know, we have seen younger people, for example, Afghanistan 1400, right? This was a genuine political party that attempted to you know, become a, you know, a national party in its scope. It had membership, it had you know, grand ideas. You know, what happened was that they all were a you know, victim of this you know, patronage politics, you know, the, the division uh, of the 2014 and 2019 presidential elections. You know, these were two small you know, groups to resist this massive you know, change that were coming underway. So I think now going forward, I think Afghanistan needs to have this debate, either a presidential or parliamentary or federal system. I think that 
debate is quite an important one, but it is also, I think, important that we, you know, shift the debate, the blame, you know, often it is easily directed towards ethnic entrepreneurs, you know, or sometimes Afghan society is too backward you know, to have this kind of national political parties. But if you look closely, I think there were many, many efforts, you know, that were killed, uh, you know, in the in, in, in infancy. Uh, by you know this uh, environment which was created in in Afghanistan during this period. Professor Maui. Yeah. Uh, one can always come up with arguments that now is not the right time to talk about institutions, but I think that's actually a very dangerous kind of attitude to take, particularly when one has in Afghanistan a young population that's been influenced by globalization in a way that no previous generation has, which creates scope for a certain amount of uh, imagination and creativity when one's talking about future institutions, which really are going to impact on the lives of those young people much more than elderly academics in the West like me. Uh, having said that, I think there are two points, however, that come up as uh, significant obstructions. One is uh, a collective action problem that even if an existing institution may be broadly dysfunctional in its impact on the practice of politics and social life in Afghanistan, there are certain people who benefit very strongly from the existing framework. The, the people who are embedded in a kind of neo-patrimonial structure, which is rewarding both financially and politically, they can be expected to fight much more strongly to retain the existing system than even the larger number of people who might be disadvantaged by the existing system, but have so many problems in their day-to-day -day lives that they don't have much time to devote to politics. So there's that classic kind of problem that arises. There's also the problem of how far one can go, because when one has an existing constitutional structure, typically one will find within it mechanisms in place specifying how an amendment of that framework can be accomplished. And I think there is a danger which was very obvious in the material that emanated from the State Department uh, at the time that the idea of the Istanbul conference was uh, uh, mooted that one can simply throw out everything that's been done for 20 years uh, and come up with blithe notions of wiping the slate clean without that necessarily having some pretty bad unintended consequences really that um, the the danger is that one can inadvertently trash the whole idea of constitutionalized politics uh, and instead create the impression that whoever gets power can just uh, put in place a set of arrangements that uh, will uh, be suitable to that uh, power holder or set of power holders. And in a sense, the whole point of constitutionalism is to limit the exercise of power. That's why I think it's very difficult, incidentally, in the Taliban context, because um, they've not shown any enthusiasm ever for limitations being imposed on their exercise of power through law and things like that. Uh, and uh, they, they really don't bring a constitutionalist mindset to discussions at all. But that doesn't mean that it's not important to talk about these kinds of issues. And I think Dr. Hamadi's made a great contribution by putting some of these issues on the table for us. And, and along these lines, um, you know, getting back to uh, Dr. Ibrahimi's point about, you know, society versus institutions. I mean, uh, uh, even when individual groups had strong grassroots incentives, they were beginning to form coalitions in, in society. It became very difficult to translate that kind of momentum into any kind of sustained political uh, movement because the the institutions prevented these groups, the political prevented new parties from emerging. So we may have Hambas de Gimeli, you know, uh, organizing, but this will be under the current law, their ability to aggregate, to, to build, to create a larger kind of consensus is really constrained by the formal institutional rules. And so getting you know, touching on this institutional question again, I, I want to get to a point that, you know, Professor Barfield has mentioned federalism. We've had this discussion of federalism. Uh, the paper talks about decentralization, doesn't, um, as many of you noted, uh, doesn't uh, move towards federalism. I think maybe there's a sense that this is just too, too much of a jump um, given the current political constraints, but any kind of move towards decentralization or towards federalism in Afghanistan would require an elevation of subnational units. And this is an important question 
um, in terms of, of thinking about the future. And, and Professor Maley, you know, you've said that we should be thinking about these issues. There's always an important time to thinking to think about them. Uh, I think it was you who talked about the proliferation of provinces. Uh, Professor Barfield's mentioned this as well, that, that there were a certain number of regions, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, the number of provinces has really proliferated. When I started doing research in Afghanistan uh, more than 15 years ago, there were about 16,000 villages. That's what the Central Statistics Office calculated as the amount of aid was allocated per village. The number of villages suddenly jumped to more than 30,000 in, in a matter of three years. The number of villages doubled magically. Um, the number of provinces has increased. At one po point in time, the, the IDLG, the Independent Directorate of Local Governance, didn't even know how many districts there were in the country because these districts kept proliferating. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to elevate subnational units in terms of decentralization and federalism, you know, the United States, by, by way of comparison, has 50,000 subnational units. This not only includes local government units, but trash collection units, school districts, about mm -hmm. 30,000 local government units, that's the same amount as Afghanistan has. These are very difficult to sustain fiscally, financially, right? So there has to be a kind of rethinking, I think, about the role of the province, how many provinces, uh, but this is a very sensitive issue right now. Um, and uh, what, do you see any kind of movement on this? Is there, is there, are there people thinking about this right now in Kabul? Um, how can this, this kind of issue be addressed if the country is going to move towards the kind of decentralized system that Dr. Ahmadi talks about, towards a more federal system that some of you have suggested? Well, in 2019, the IDLG did put out a, a very substantial document in Persian, which attempted to create at least a kind of baseline from which one could begin to make some uh, assessments about structures within the state. Uh, it, it, to me, one of the great problems really is the dearth of non-controversial vocabulary in this particular area, because every kind of expression which to Western political scientists uh, seems entirely uncontroversial runs the risk of raising red flags uh, in different circles in Afghanistan. And uh, it's seemed to me one of the ways in which one could usefully look at this is not even talk about centralization or decentralization, but instead about matching the capacities of the state to the needs of the people. Uh, and that then does open discussion of a whole range of other important issues, such as uh, the fiscal sustainability of responsibilities. Now, we have a federal system in Australia, and for decades there have been significant problems arising from the fact that the states have responsibility for areas where costs tend to rise quickly, such as hospital uh, care, uh, with increasing medical technology of a sophisticated variety being available, at the same time that they have a taxing capacity which uh, guarantees at best a very slow growth uh, in taxes because in tax revenues because uh, they don't uh, rise in the kind of semi-automatic fashion that income taxes can generate greater volumes of, of revenue. And we have this expression of vertical fiscal imbalance in Australia to describe that particular problem. So it, it may well be that there are ways in which one can try to uh, unpack the issue of the distribution of power within the state even further than current discussion has gone, but from a functional point of view to try to explore ways in which the needs of the people, which are quite complex, can nonetheless be matched by state activities. In that sense, it may be interesting to look back at some earlier post-2000 and one exercises like the National Solidarity Program, which did have its difficulties, but which saw local organisations having much more say in the spending of at least some resources than uh, otherwise might have been the case. And that didn't seem to raise the same kind of red flags that some other vocabularies did. I don't, I'm not saying that there's an easy answer to this particular problem because these, uh, the, the discussion is one which is in, entwined and entangled with notions of power and identity as well and that that's always a complicating factor but i remain optimistic that one day we'll find a way of trying to unpack these issues effectively okay 
Uh, so, you know, moving on, I think, to this issue of uh, religious accommodation. It's not something, it's something that's mentioned quite a lot in the, in the paper and not something that we've talked about. And of course, um, you know, these issues of religious difference often map onto the kind of ethnic differences that we've spoken about today. Uh, but do any of you think that there is a compelling argument to be made with the Taliban, you know, using the language that Dr. Ahmadi, uh, you know, who, who's a scholar of Islamic jurisprudence, um, I think quite eloquently talks about the role of, um, you know, the different religious madhabs, uh, that, what role that they can play in uh, politics. And it's a way of coming to terms with the Islamic nature of the constitution. And of course, that the Republic and the Taliban have the very two very different visions of what the role Islam should play in politics. But um, I, I was curious to know what your thoughts were on the integration of these different schools of thought in uh, future constitutional orders, or whether this could be something that unites people more than divides if we're going to speak about religious, um, I, uh, religious uh, perspectives rather than ethnic perspectives. May I? Yes, please. Okay. <clears throat> this is also one of the very important aspects of uh, Afghan politics, no doubt. And Dr. Ahmadi is very good in, in, in this issue. And uh, <clears throat> at the moment, uh, uh, though we have uh, ulama councils, and uh, which has almost some sort of uh, 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 advisory role or uh, nothing more than that, but they, uh, time to time, they interfere on the, on the various issues. Uh, at the moment, our, uh, we have uh, in our constitution only a couple of clauses about this, which, uh, which, uh, which says that uh, uh, every follower of the, every religions, they are free to practice uh, their religion regardless of what, what's of and, and uh, about the Shias and, uh, and the Sunnis, it says that, uh, that the, the followers of the uh, Shia faith, which is Jafari is also said that, Fitka Jafari, so they, uh, uh, their uh, religion or sect is also recognized. But when, uh, when there is uh, some, uh, some issues in the court between the Shias and, uh, and the uh, Sunnis, then the court will act upon the verdicts of the uh, Hanafi sect. But it is, it is again, again, uh, uh, very good because in that regard, I don't see too much differences as, as I, I'm in touch with uh, uh, Dr. Ahmadi. I read a couple of his article about this. This is a very good approach. But now the issue is this is also the, the part of, uh, you see, either you will, uh, the issue is either you will solve all these issues uh, um, uh, institutionally, or you will solve it through a very flawed type of consociational setup. See, in Afghanistan, it is happening. That is the issue. Uh, like uh, 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 Ibrahimi said, it was a very good practice. And I would say that in Afghanistan, the left, the left people, when they ruled 14 years, I think they were, they were dealing with this issue. I don't say about the other aspects of their governance, but they were dealing with the issue of ethnicity and the religion very, very cleverly uh, and very smartly. For example, they have recognized all the ethnic group. And in Afghanistan, it was in the constitution, there was only one class that the official religion of Afghanistan is Islam and that's all. And all the followers of all the religions, they are free to practice. And there will be, uh, 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 the courts will accordingly deal with, uh, will deal with the issue by the, uh, uh, by the uh, law, which, is, which were mostly the uh, civic law. Uh, now in, in, in coming, uh, coming days, how, how the situation will be folded, I would say that Taliban will very radically uh, will deal with this issue because some of the participants who met directly in Moscow and they discuss it behind the scene, this issue. And the Taliban, they bluntly say that we don't believe in such divisions. There will be only one religion in Afghanistan. If you will recognize the, the Shia uh, religion, so then we, we will have to recognize the Salafis. Then we have to recognize the Ismailis. Then we have to recognize the other as a, a smallest school of thoughts in Islam. They don't believe in this. 
But anyway, uh, I would say that uh, this, the thing which I, uh, uh, I've been saying uh, on, on this vertical distribution of power on the vertical uh, part of the political system, it can address this issue very easily. And uh, there are some good models in the, in the world, like you can see toward even Indonesia. You see, in one province, you got, you got Kartya, I think, uh, they have king. Grandfather was king, son was king, and now grandson is the king. And, it, it, and, it, it, and he has the constitutional protection. In Aceh, just see the people, they, have, uh, they had the referendum and they said, we want a Sharia law. And it was, it was doing all uh, with a very good institutional, uh, you see, uh, uh, setup. So it is, it is quite possible if the Taliban uh, would step down a little bit, one or two steps, Afghanistan is the home of different type of people. How will you rule by force? I don't know this, see the 21st century and this is stone, stone age type of approach. Uh, I would say that there is only one, uh, only one way uh, that to, to institutionally address this issue, issue and uh, let the people to practice their faith, uh, their religion, uh, uh, which, which was inherited by their uh, father, grandfather, grand-grandfather. Now they believe in certain religions and faiths. So uh, that's why Dr. Ahmadi's approach in that regard is, is much better, much better. Thank you. So, you know, I think we've had a, a very long conversation today. We have just a few minutes left and I, and I wanna wrap things up with really asking all of you um, to share your perspective on whether, you know, it, it's whether this is, this changes are possible, where you see the Taliban moving. Uh, we've had so many interesting discussions and, you know, it, on the one hand, you know, Afghanistan is of course facing a very dire situation, uh, but on the other hand, this possibility of change is an opportunity for all of us to rethink these institutions. So on the one hand, it's very difficult. On the other hand, we see these very creative proposals at a time when we know that institutional change may be possible. And so I'm gonna ask all of you to sort of conclude with your thoughts of where you see things going um, in terms of both the institutional change and the willingness of the Taliban to accept uh, this kind of institutional reform and accommodation that we're describing. Um, so Dr. Ibrahimi, I'll, I'll uh, begin with you because we, oh. we, we ended with you in the very beginning. Uh, uh, thank you, I'll be quite brief. Uh, I might also uh, quickly comment on the issue of women rights I think you mentioned. And I think here um, I see you know, Dr. Ahmadi's approach is you know, fundamentally different from that of the Taliban. The Taliban have a literal, literal uh, interpretation of Sharia law with regards to women. And whereas Dr. Ahmadi is proposing a more um, in the current thinking, which is you know, trying to see Islamic injunctions with regards to women in this historical context and, and, and bringing uh, the issues of public interest and all of those things. So I think there's a lot of progressive thinking here, I think which must be really appreciated and promoted. But I think we should also see evidence of change on that front from the Taliban. And here, I think my concern is that for the Taliban, the issue of women is really a, a, a centrally important one. Uh, and, and they would like to see many of them try to reverse the changes in their view that were imposed, you know, as they would say, on the Afghan society over the past 20 years. And one of those areas I would like to reverse is, I think, the issue of women's rights. Because they were such a central factor in their propaganda. And I think, you know, it would be very hard for them to take a step back on the issue of women's rights. And on where things are going, I think, you know, it is, uh, Afghanistan is a, in a very, very difficult situation. Uh, and I think a lot depends on international support post withdrawal. Uh, and I think you know, while you know, many issues, unfortunately, will have to be determined by in the battlefield, um, but I think it is useful to engage in this conversation. It's really imaginative thinking, um, at least to contribute to what are possible ways out of the conflict. So if, if I understand you correctly, you, you don't see the Taliban accommodating on some of these fundamental issues. Uh, well, I, I don't have much many reasons to believe, unfortunately. I, mean, I haven't seen a reformed Taliban yet. 
Professor Barfield. I, I too do not see the Taliban changing at the moment. I think one of the useful things that comes out of papers like this and discussion is that too much at the moment is focused on either the Taliban or sort of the Ashraf Ghani government, neither of which are, could probably win a majority of the Afghan people in a fair vote. However, the more ideas that are out there so that it isn't a choice between these two different institutions, the greater the possibilities that a third alternative might come up. I would note that Afghanistan, unfortunately, is now close to 100 years of an unresolved dispute of which the Taliban represent one side, the Ashraf Ghani another. Most of these reforms that the Taliban condemn were not internationally induced. They were proposed by Amanullah in the 1920s. And what we've seen is switches from governments on one side, revolutions that overthrow them, 29 becoming reactionary, 78 becoming um, secularist, leftist, 96 back to Taliban religion, 2001 open kind of Amanolist sort of model. And now we're, we're back again. What we have is an unresolved conflict in Afghan society. As was pointed out by other speakers, this is not um, uh, a conflict that has disappeared in other societies. I sit in the United States where we just saw off four years of Trump. And many of us in the United States feel that we have people that we didn't much understand before. But what we, what we didn't suffer from was a collapse of the state and a collapse of the nation because of that. Afghanistan has never resolved this dispute between the two ideologies. But on the other hand, it's a state that suffered from a radical move from one to another, neither of which has, has become stable. I think one of the things that we need to look for now is the Afghan population, majority, slight majority, has been born since 2001. Um, too many of the people engaged in this conversation are people like myself or the people that rule Afghanistan or sit at Doha that are really old. We do not represent this new population. And we have yet to hear where that population stands. That's one of the reasons I think that even if the Taliban take Kabul, they would find it extremely difficult to govern. They found it almost impossible in, two, in, 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 in the mid 90s. I think they would find it impossible now, but that doesn't say much for stability of Afghanistan. But I think we need to break out of the traditional ways that we look at structures and constitutions in Afghanistan, which I think Mahdi is, is, is doing in his paper, to get the broadest possible things out there, not because they can create a framework for peace now, but that in the future, we have better ideas as opposed to, it seems, for a historian, it's great. I don't have to learn very much new. It seems to be the same thing happening all the time. I would like to see, for Afghanistan's sake, that this old pattern be totally broken and replaced. Great, thank you. Professor Malley. Uh, I, uh, Tom's comment there reminds me of, uh, of Edmund Burke's saying that a, a, a state is not governed that must be perpetually conquered. Uh, and I think that's true, but sometimes a state can be ruled without being governed, and that's a very dangerous kind of uh, scenario in Afghanistan at the moment. Just picking up the point that you raised, uh, Jennifer, about religion earlier and where that might fit into this discussion, not, not uh, from a slightly different context, it brought to my mind um, Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass and the exchange between uh, Alice and Humpty Dumpty, uh, which I will quote, when I use a word Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful voice, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be the master, that's all. And I think that is a window also into the thinking of the Taliban about religion. I don't think they're interested in scholarly uh, discourse and uh, the refutation of their views by learned reference to text. I think they have a certain mindset which is very firmly set in place 
I had an aunt in Australia who was a bit like that herself, and uh, uh, and it tends to divide the world into us plus the people who are wrong. Uh, and in that sense, and I'll conclude with this point, uh, I think there's a very important point that Dr. Ahmadi makes in his paper, where he says, of course, there is no place for civil society in their discourse. In the Taliban discourse, the structure of power is highly centralized and absolute. And I think that's true. It remains the case that um, their mindset in the late 1990s was totalitarian, but they didn't have the instrumentalities of the state available to them, which would have allowed them to behave in the way in which other totalitarian regimes historically have behaved. But I don't think the absence of the mindset uh, 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 has uh, set in since that period of time. I think they still have a very rigid view of how the world should be structured and their proceeding to try to give effect to it could be very dangerous for people on the ground in Afghanistan. Great, thank you. Dr. Yasa, we have about one minute left. Yeah, I am, I am glad that uh, today I was the, one of the participants of this wonderful meeting and uh, I wish Dr. Ahmadi, uh, 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 wish him good luck. And uh, he, has a, he has a very wonderful paper though he himself has already uh, said in his, one of his interviews that uh, uh, we don't have a common language with the Taliban. And uh, from the women rights up to the uh, civic values, democracy, elections, we don't have a single type of similarity. So he, his uh, interview is on the record, but I still wish him uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, uh, that uh, he should continue his research work. And uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me in such a wonderful conversation. Uh, whatever will happen, but we should be the good people from, uh, from among the international community and as well as uh, from Afghanistan itself. Uh, there should be a continuous type of conversation, interaction, and uh, I think we can learn a lot from the uh, distinguished persons like uh, Barfield, like uh, Professor Mele, and my friend, Mr. Ebrahimi. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. Uh, this was a real pleasure and honor to learn so much from you um, uh, during the course of this conversation. And uh, thanks to our colleagues at AISS for putting this all together. Uh, this is uh, quite a delightful opportunity to have this discussion. And uh, just to quote Professor Barfield once more, that having these ideas in circulation is really important. Whatever happens to them is really up to the people of Afghanistan. Um, but uh, let's hope that, uh, and let's hope that it's up to the people of Afghanistan, right? Um, that the decision about these ideas, but having more circulation of these ideas, I think is quite important for the future. And I'd encourage all of you uh, to download Dr. Ahmadi's paper, an assessment of the possibility of producing consensus within the parliamentary and decentralized system of democracy in Afghanistan. It is a very creative paper. It is one of the most impressive that I have seen, the most um, unique. It really is presents a concrete pathway uh, towards accommodation, towards developing a modus vivendi for the future. Uh, so thanks to all of you. Thanks to our audience for being with us today. And I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you.